where you can show him to us? I'm sure he's close by. Let me go see if I can find him. I'll be right back. <laughs> Evidently, he didn't want to come. Her wasn't as close as she thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, she kept looking down, so I thought he might be right there by her. Mm -hmm. Oh. It's funny when you look on YouTube, the only people showing are the ones that have their video on. <laughs> so over half of you don't even show, people don't even know that you're here <laughs> when they watch the um, YouTube. The replay. Or is that yeah. live? It's live. It's not on. So the replay doesn't either, but um same with the same with all of them. Like I'm watching the one that's on Roku and stuff, and it's uh <laughs> well there's a happy face. Yep. Yeah. Abel. <laughs> oh, there oh. we go. <laughs> Melissa, look at Abel's baby. We got two oh, babies on. The big oh, one. Abel, who is that? I didn't know you had a doggy. That's my daughter's dog. Thank you. What's your doggy's name? Uh, Angie. Angie? Angie? Yes. It's a girl. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, you guys, you guys remember Destiny, don't you? Yes. Yeah. She's uh, she had a little boy two weeks ago. So I'm a grandpa. Yay! Hello. Oh, my goodness. Goodness. Congratulations. Congratulations. I'm. I haven't seen him yet, but. Oh my god. All right. Well, tell her hi for her soon. Yeah, tell Destiny I said hello and that I miss her. She lives in uh, Carolina. Where? North Carolina. Oh, North wow. Carolina. All right. A long so ways off. I started to say she didn't get very far from home, did she? <laughs> 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 tell her you tell her hi for us and. Uh, Tell her to get on here once in a while and show her little face and her baby. Yes. I saw the kitty, Melissa. She looks good. Yes, he gained his weight back. He's looking really good. He's a big cat. <laughs> He's not even the bigger of the two. I have two cats. <laughs> Well, I don't know about cats. I never had cats, but the, believe me, you, one dog's plenty and then some. <laughs> <laughs> I like cats, but I'm allergic to cats. Oh. Their hair makes me sick. What a I shame. Guess you'll have to get you one of those hairless cats. Oh, I never thought of that. They're expensive, <laughs> though. Well, okay. there's, there's two types of kitties. One that uh, loves to sit in your lap, and the other is you you can chase them and you can't ever catch them. <laughs> I'll take the one that likes to sit in the 
Yeah. I have two of that first kind. <laughs> two cats, two dogs, 12 chickens. That's what I got. <laughs> You got a house full. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking I had to beat. When I worked for the veterinarian, I took the rejects home. I had, I think I had four cats, three dogs, a rabbit, and a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Was it a hen or a rooster? It was a rooster, actually. Oh, so my true. neighbor, my neighbor, made me give it away. <laughs> Angela, did you have something? No, I just wanted to be able to join. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Happy uh, Sabbath. Uh, Sabbath. So, Abel, did you tell us, and I missed it, boy or girl? Uh, boy. Boy. What's his name? Um, Lewis. Something like uh, Joe, <laughs> Lewis, Lewis. Well. That's so awesome. Yeah, when I lost my cat, I... I wouldn't get another one because I said, I'll probably be gone myself in, the, in a little while. And then what would happen to my cat? But I didn't know I was going to live this long. <laughs> you, can, you can get a senior cat, too. Uh -huh. <laughs> Good morning, Kimber. Yeah, because those senior cats and dogs are the ones really need home because most people won't adopt the older ones. Yeah, I have no way of getting to a place to get one. Well, surely there's somebody that would take you. I don't have family anymore here. Oh. Hey. Keith, are you there or um Yeah. From Psalms 95. Oh come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands form the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he hallowed it. And we have just seen the results of him making us Abel's new grandson. Hey, Kimber. I've, I've got a new grandson on the way, too. Wow. Very good. That's kind of exciting. Yep. Well, I'm going to try to get things going here properly. Okay.
Okay. I think we're up and ready to go here. Let's start with, with prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the many great miracles that you do in our lives. And uh, the birth of a child is just one of those miracles. Thank you for doing so many good things and uh, being willing to help us in our times of need. As I'm sharing some of those situations, I pray that you'd speak through me and help each of us to be encouraged and learn to trust you no matter what's going on. Be with us and guide us in our time together here. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I like this verse here, Second Chronicles 16, 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. And it's almost like it's, it's telling us that God looks for ways that he can do something for us. And, you know, it's, it's like he's, he's watching out for us all the time and, and wanting to help us and, and wanting to do something that that encourages us. And uh, so this is just one promise, one uh, indicator that uh, God wants to help us. <clears throat> I've got some other promises here. And uh, we'll be looking at various uh, situations where God fulfilled some of these promises. Isaiah 59, 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. And Psalm 91, 11, and this, this whole psalm, whole, uh, all of Psalm 91 is just full of, of uh, I mean, it covers almost any situation you can think of where we might need some help from God. And uh, this, of course, this one is just kind of a general overview. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. And Psalm 37, 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him and delivereth them. And I like this quote from the Desire of Ages. This is just one sentence in a, in a whole paragraph of encouragement. Our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. And so, you know, whatever the situation is, God is able, he's totally capable of providing whatever we need to help us out. <clears throat> and his provision can come in all kinds of different forms. Sometimes uh, people have needed food. Sometimes they've needed protection, uh, guidance, help while they're traveling. You know, there's all kinds of ways that God has stepped in to uh, help various people. And uh, basically what I want to do is share some stories that I found of where God stepped in in various ways to help where heaven intervened to provide something that was needed. Some of these stories come from the Bible. Some of them are from back in history. Some of them are modern times. Some are of famous people. Some are more personal. And so I just wanted to share these things. God still cares. Miracles still happen. Heaven still intervenes. <laughs> Sometimes in very unique ways. We have the story of Elijah in 1 Kings 17. And the chapter starts out with God, or with Elijah going into King Ahab and telling him that there wasn't going to be any rain because, uh, you know, people were not following God. And then Elijah just walked out of the palace. And in verse 2, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Now ordinarily, ravens would eat any, almost anything they can find. And so it was a very unique situation where God had the ravens bring 
food to Elijah because ordinarily they'd eat the food themselves. And so, you know, this was, this was a miracle that the ravens would feed him. I read a story, it's been years ago, and I don't remember all the details of it, but I want to share it. Maybe some of you have heard the story. Some years ago, there was a pastor in communist Russia that was arrested by the KGB and put in prison. And he would talk with the other prisoners uh, about God and share uh, the gospel with them. And the prison warden got really upset with him and you know wanted to stop this whole thing. And he said to the pastor, he said, so you say your God is so good and that he takes care of you. Well, we're going to see about that. And he locked him up in a cell by himself and left him there to starve. Well, the pastor was uh, praying the next morning. And as he was praying, he heard a little sound up by the, the barred window of his cell. And he looked up. And there was a cat up there, and the cat had a piece of bread in its mouth, and it dropped the piece of bread and then went back out through the bars. And uh, each day, this cat came back with a piece of bread, and the pastor was able to kind of survive on this little bit of bread that the cat brought him. Well, one day, the prison warden came back and uh, came into the cell to see how well his prisoner was starving, and uh, he said to the, to the pastor, so is your God still good? And the pastor said, yes, he still is good and he takes care of me. Well, they were, the, 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 the warden was giving him a hard time there. And uh, all of a sudden there was a little noise up by the barred window again. And there was the cat bringing its slice of bread to the pastor and the warden looked up there and he saw the cat and he said, that's my cat. So that was a very unique way that God provided for the needs of the pastor there. We have another verse here. For in time of trouble, he will hide me in his pavilion, Psalm 27, 5. And uh, I found a story that actually happened many, many years ago, back in 1662. It was kind of during the Reformation time and churches were getting uh, reorganized and split up and there was various things happening. And there were a bunch of uh, pastors that were basically in trouble with the government. And one of these pastors in England was being pursued by his enemies. And uh, he went into what was called a malt house. It was a place where they... Uh, processed grain to make malt for making beer. And there was a, a kiln in there where they would dry the grain after the, you know, part of the process. They would dry the grain in this kiln. And uh, apparently what the, the place wasn't actually functioning this particular day. And the pastor went in there and he hid in one of the kilns in this malt house. And as soon as he crawled in through the small opening of the kiln, a spider came along and started weaving a web over the opening of the kiln. And he got so fascinated watching this spider do its work there that he almost forgot that he was actually in danger. And uh, the spider created a web over the whole opening. And uh, pretty soon after that, the people that were pursuing him came in there looking for him. And uh, they were looking all around and they came to the kiln, and uh, one of them said, well, he could never, it, he, it's no use looking in there because he couldn't be in there. There's a spider over the, you know, a spider web over the opening there, and uh, he could never get in there without breaking the spider web. And so he was protected by the spider. Well, we have another story from the Bible, and this is about Elisha, when the king of Syria was wanting to invade, and one of his plans was to capture the king of Israel. But every time the king of Syria would make some plan of how he was going to capture the king of Israel, 
Elisha would go and warn the king of Israel, don't go past this certain place because uh, the king of Syria is waiting for you there. So the, the king of Syria was totally unsuccessful with his plans. And he finally got frustrated and he asked, he gathered his officers together and he says, who is the traitor in my camp here? And uh, that's telling the king of Israel what my plans are. Well, somebody spoke up and said, well, it's not anybody here. It's Elisha, the prophet over in Israel. He tells the king of Israel everything that you say in your bedroom. And so the king of Syria says, well, okay, we got we to gotta deal with this. And so he sent his army to where Elisha was living in the little town of Dothan. And they surrounded the city. And the story goes on in 2 Kings 6, starting in verse 15. When the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host was com compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. So Elisha prayed that the eyes of this young man would be opened so he could see something that he hadn't seen before. <clears throat> So then the chariots, the, 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 the soldiers came down and it says, and when they came down to him to capture him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. So first of all, he prayed that God would open the eyes of the servant. Now he prayed that God would blind the eyes of the army. So when they came close, Elisha said unto them, this is not the way, neither is this the city. And this is kind of a humorous little incident here. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. And he came, it came to pass when they were come into Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. So God opened eyes and then he blinded the eyes and then he opened the eyes again. And, you know, it's, it's just kind of an interesting story there. It's like uh, God has kind of a sense of humor of how he works sometimes. Well, I found another story of somebody that uh, prayed for eyes to be blinded. Here's a book. It's called God's Smuggler. And it's a story of a man that was called Brother Andrew. He was a Dutch Christian who felt a burden to get Christian materials into communist countries. This was back in the 1950s when the Iron Curtain was very, very much uh, in place. Nobody could get in and out of communist countries without special permission. And people in those countries were being persecuted for being Christians. And uh, Brother Andrew wanted to take uh, Bibles and other literature into those countries for the people there. And so the book is called God's Smuggler because he was smuggling materials into those countries. And this is the story of the very first time that he went alone into Yugoslavia. He was traveling into Yugoslavia through Austria. And so this starts where he's coming up to the border. And I'll just read it because it's just, it's just in his words, it's just so good. Just ahead was the Yugoslav border. For the first time in my life, I was about to enter a communist country on my own instead of in a group invited and sponsored by the government. He had been in Russia and in various other countries a few other times with groups, you know, youth groups that went to a, a convention or something there, but now he was going by himself. I stopped the little VW on the outskirts of the tiny Austrian village and took stock. The Yugoslav government in 1957 permitted visitors to bring in only articles for their personal use. Anything new or anything in quantity was suspect because of the black market thriving all over the country. Printed mater material especially was liable to be confiscated at the border, no matter how small the quantity, because coming from out of the country, it was regarded as foreign propaganda. Now here I was with a car and luggage literally bulging with tracts and Bibles and portions of Bibles. How was I to get them past the border guard? And so for the first time of many times, I said the prayer of God's smuggler, 
Lord, in my luggage, I have scripture that I want to take to your children across this border. When you were on the earth, you made blind eyes to see. Now, I pray, make seeing eyes blind. Do not let the guards see the things you don't want them to see. And so, armed with this prayer, I started the motor and drove up to the bar barrier. The two guards appeared both startled and pleased to see me. I wondered how much business came their way. From the way they stared at my passport, it might have been the first Dutch one they had ever seen. There were just a few formalities to attend to, they assured me in German, and I could be on my way. One of the guards began poking around in my camping gear. In the corners and folds of my sleeping bag and tent were boxes of tracts. Lord, make those, make those seeing eyes blind. You have anything to declare? One of them asked. Well, I have my money and a wristwatch and a camera. The other guard was looking inside the VW. He asked me to take out a suitcase. I knew that there were tracts scattered all through my clothing in that suitcase. Of course, sir, I said. I pulled the front seat forward and dragged the suitcase out. I placed it on the ground and opened the lid. The guard lifted the shirts that lay on top, and beneath them, now in plain sight, was a pile of tracts in two different Yugoslav dialects, Croatian and Slovene. How was God going to handle this situation? It seems dry for this time of year, I said to the other guard, and without looking at the fellow who was inspecting the suitcase, I fell into a conversation about the weather. I told him about my own homeland, which was Holland, and how it was always wet on the polders. Finally, when I could stand the suspense no longer, I looked behind me. The first guard wasn't even glancing at the suitcase. He was listening to our conversation. When I turned around, he caught himself and looked up. Well, then, you have anything else to declare? Only some small things, I said. The tracks were small, after all. We won't bother with them, said the guard. He nodded to me that I could close the suitcase and with a little salute handed me back my passport. And so God closed the seeing eyes so that he could take the Bibles to the people that needed them in Russia. Another verse here, Psalm 32, verse 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. And I like that. It's, it's, it's encouraging because it's bas basically telling us God will guide us with his vision because our vision is so limited. We don't see everything that's going on. So with his all-knowing vision, he can guide us in the right ways. I have another story here, and this actually comes from another book, but I had to summarize it because it's, a, it's kind of a long story. And so I kind of shortened it up a little bit. This book is called A Call to the Churches in America. And this is the story of Christians in Russia as the communists were taking over back in the early 1900s when the Bolshevik Revolution took place and communists were getting power. Uh, Lenin was getting into power and all this was happening. And uh, so they were having, they were beginning to have trouble there. And the story that I'm going to share comes from actually 1932. And... Uh, it's a story of a, of a man named Ivan and his family. They lived in central re Ukraine, and he was considered a fairly wealthy farmer because he had eight cows and two purebred horses. And there was rumors going around that uh, the communists were starting to confiscate property and arrest Christians and, uh, you know, sending them off to Siberia and things like that. And uh, so Ivan was praying for God's guidance and, you know, what, what should we do in this situation? And one night while he was praying, God said to him, My son, I will lead you to the country of China. Get ready for your journey. On a certain night, you're going to leave this village. Now, at that time, China wasn't under communist rule. And so it was a safer place than what Russia was. God told him, you will leave your house, your cattle, your horses, everything. Hitch your milk cow to your horse cart. Take some, some bags of millet and some other food and uh, leave in the evening after dark by a certain side road and go to a certain village. And God told him exactly where to go, where he could stay. He named the village. And so, you know, this was the plan that God told him. And he was a little bit puzzled because he had two really good horses 
And now God told him to use the milk cow on his cart. And that seemed kind of strange to him. But God even named the cow, told him the name of the, the right cow. And so he obeyed. And on that night, the family got together. They, he did his chores, fed the animals, turned the lights on in the house. And they loaded their things in the horse cart, hitched the cow to the horse cart, and then they just left by the by the the street. And as they were going down the street, people looked at them and they said, "Oh no, another gypsy family coming into the village." Now at that time there were a lot of gypsies traveling around, and they were stealing and they were causing trouble. And you know people didn't like the gypsies because they were such troublesome people. And so people kind of just avoided this family, because they thought they were gypsies. Well, at that time, the communists were gaining a lot of power, and uh, people were spying on their neighbors, and uh, they would report anything that they saw that seemed a little bit unusual, and uh, people were not allowed to do anything without getting special permission. They couldn't leave the village, they couldn't do anything uh, without special permission <clears throat> from the police, and uh, so this was... Um, Kind of a unique situation but they were able to get out of town and uh, because people thought that they were just gypsies nobody reported them and because they had the milk cow on the cart instead of a horse they were able to milk the cow and they needed some some milk they had food with them and uh, so they were able to get out of the village well that very night the kgb came to arrest this man and, uh, you know, he was considered a rich man. And they said, well, you know, rich people are the enemy of the people. And so they were going to arrest him and take him off to wherever. But there was nobody there because they had already left. So the KGB waited until morning. They saw their tracks going out of the gate onto the main road. And so the police hurried down the main road trying to catch them. But they had turned off on a side road and... Uh, so they avoided getting arrested. And they went to the next village. And it's like day by day, God told them, go to this village. They didn't have a map. God just told them, go to the next village. He told them where they could stay. And he some, sometimes would even tell them that there were certain people in that village that they could trust. And so they could go to those people. And there were other people that they couldn't trust. And so they had to avoid that. <clears throat> and they finally... It took them all summer to get across from Ukraine to the China border, but they finally arrived at the Chinese border, and there the border guards stopped them, took away their cow, their cart, the food that they had, and here they were forced to work in, in uh, hard labor, and they were made to cut grass for hay for the horses of the border guards, and that kind of... Uh, really frustrated Ivan and his family because he thought that God was taking them to freedom. And here they were stuck in this situation. They lost everything. They had to live in a tent and work for the border guards. But God told them, don't worry, I'll still take you to China. Well, one day they were out cutting hay and a fire broke out. And it was kind of a windy day and the fire spread quite quickly and everybody panicked including the border guards. Everybody was running in every direction to get away from the fire. And Ivan and his family ran so they could get away. They were finally able to get out of the way of the fire. And uh, so they, they kind of felt safe, but they were totally exhausted, totally worn out. And Ivan, again, questioned, Lord, what is going on here? Why is this happening? I thought you were going to take us to China. And God said, you are in China right now. And they were able to, you know, they were already across the border without the border guards stopping them. And God was able to lead them through China. They stayed in China for a while, but eventually they were able to leave China and come to America. And so they were saved because they had God's specific guidance. Day by day, each day, he told them what to do and they obeyed. And so they were safe because they were doing that. And, uh, you know, it's just another example of God leading through all the details. 
Well, here's a picture. I should have brought this picture up. This was kind of some of the things that were happening during that time. You have Lenin up there doing a speech of propaganda and uh, people getting arrested and all those kind of things. That's some of the things that were going on. Okay, another verse. This comes from Luke 8, 25. And uh, this is the story of Jesus and his disciples out in the boat and the storm came up and the disciples panicked, but Jesus woke up and said, peace be still. And they were amazed. Jesus asked them here in this verse, where is your faith? And they being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, what manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and the water, and they obey him. So God has control of the weather. Most people have heard of George Mueller. He was quite famous for his uh, faith work. He started several orphanages in England, and it was his personal policy to never ask people for things that he needed. It was his policy to just pray about it and let God take care of the situation. Well, in August of 1877, he was traveling by ship. This is the ship SS Sardinian from England to Quebec. He lived in England, but he had been invited to preach in Quebec, and uh, he was traveling by the ship. Well, the ship ran into really, really thick fog, and the captain, Joseph Dutton, had slowed the ship down because it was so dangerous to go fast. He had slowed down, and he was the captain was up in the control room, and uh, he had been there for 22 hours straight, and he felt a tap on his shoulder. And it was George Mueller. And Mr. Mueller said, Captain, I've come to tell you that I must be in Quebec on Saturday afternoon. And this was Monday, or Wednesday, I mean. And the captain said, that's impossible. We can't do it. But uh, Mr. Mueller said, I've never broken an, an engagement for 57 years. Well, I would be willing to help you, but how can I? I'm, I'm helpless. So Mr. Mueller says, well, let's go down to the chart room and we'll pray about this. And the captain said, I've never heard of such a thing. Mr. Mueller, do you know how dense this fog is? And Mr. Mueller says, my eye is not on the density of the fog, but on the living God who controls every circumstance of my life. So they went down to the to the chart room, and uh, Mr. Mueller prayed, and this is what he said. Oh, Lord, if it is consistent with thy will, please remove this fog in five minutes. You know the engagement you made for me in Quebec for Saturday, and I believe that it's your will. The captain muttered to himself that it was a prayer suitable for a class of eight or ten-year-olds. And then he started to pray, but Mr. Mueller stopped him, and said, first, you don't believe God will do this. And second, I believe he already has. And there's no need for you to pray about it. The captain was rather amazed, and Mr. Mueller continued, Captain, I have known my Lord for 57 years, and there has never been a single day that I failed to gain an audience with the king. Get up, captain, and open the door, and you will see that the fog is gone. And it was. And he got to his appointment. God does some incredible things sometimes. Another verse, Isaiah 43, verse 19. Behold, I will do a new thing. I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. This story comes from China. In the early 1900s, there was a missionary there by the name of Merit. Merritt Warren, and on one of his uh, trips that he had to make, I don't know if it was for evangelistic purposes or whatever, but it was a, it was a trip that took several days. <clears throat> he was traveling, and he got delayed in a, in a village by a stranger who was asking him about God and, and trying to you know understand about God. And so uh, Mr. Warren uh, was glad for the opportunity to, to share with somebody that was really that interested. And so he spent the afternoon visiting with this Chinese man, and he had sent his carriers that were carrying his things that he needed. He had sent them on ahead, expecting that he would catch up to them a little bit later. 
And uh, he spent the afternoon visiting with this Chinese man about the gospel and about God and things like that. And then toward evening, he thought, well, the village that they were headed toward was only a few miles away. And so he figured he'd be able to catch up with them quite easily because he had a horse and it was only a short distance. And so he was getting ready to leave and catch up to the, the men that were carrying his things. And then his, his host, the man he had been visiting with, told him that the next village, the name was Chin Tai Pu, that was the name of the village, was actually about 15 miles away. And he was going through some dangerous territory to get there because there, was, there were robbers and uh, various other criminals out there. And it was a dangerous trip. And here it was late in the evening and he had 15 miles to go. Well, he got on his horse and he was hurrying along the, as, as quickly as he could. And just as it was getting dark, he got to a small village along the way. He was hoping that his carriers had stopped in that village to wait for him, but he found out that they had gone on ahead. And so he was going to have to catch up with them. They had all of his sleeping gear. They had his food. They had his lantern. They had everything. And so here he was in the dark and uh, he borrowed or he purchased a lantern from somebody in the village there and they lighted the lantern for him. It was just a, a paper Chinese lantern with a candle in it. And uh, so he went on. But uh, after a while, as he was walking, because it was a little bit dangerous to ride his horse, he was walking with the lantern ahead of him, ahead of the horse. Uh, all of a sudden, the candle went out. And uh, he was trying to light another one to give him some light. But he got to thinking, now, if he has a light, he'll be able to see a little better. But the criminals that are supposedly lurking around this area will be able to see him better also. And so he thought, well, maybe I better not light the candle. And so he continued on his way in the dark. But that was pretty difficult because, uh, you know, here he was in unfamiliar territory. And uh, he was having to pick his way along the trail, not really able to see it very well. Well, he, he finally came to a, a, a bridge what looked like a bridge made out of stone. And he couldn't really tell whether it was just a little stream or whether it was actually a deep canyon, but the bridge was there. And so he crossed over it. And at the other side of the bridge, the trail made a turn to the right and started back up the mountain. And about uh, 150 feet up from the bottom where he crossed the bridge, he came to a house be right beside the road. <clears throat> and it was a fairly large house. And uh, right next to the road, and as he was getting close to the house, a couple of men came out of the house, and uh, he asked if uh, they would be able to help him light his lantern again. And so one of them went back into the house and came out with a, a, a piece of flaming bamboo to light his candle. And then the other man asked where he was going, and he said, well, I'm going to Chin Tai Pu. And so the man says, well, can I travel with you? Would it be okay if I was went along with you? And so he said, yeah, that was, that was good. And he was grateful for some company. And uh, after they had traveled a, a while, the man was talking about the, the robbers that were in the area and uh, that nobody was safe on the road. And he says, I'm really glad that I could travel with you. And uh, Pastor Warren thought that was kind of odd because, uh, you know, he was he was glad that the man was there with him. And here the man is saying you know, he was glad he could travel together with him. And then they came to a place where the where the path split, and the the Chinese man that was traveling with him said, "Well, I need to go this way, and uh, Chin Tai Pu is the other way." And uh, Pastor Warren says, "Well, you know, you're not going to come with me." And he said, no, it's only a little ways. You'll come to the town fairly quickly, but I need to go off this way. And uh, so Pastor Warren went on and pretty soon he arrived in the village and the people there knew he was coming because the carriers had already arrived there. And so they were kind of worried about him. But uh, he finally did arrive and they said, you know, we're glad you came through because uh, there's been a lot of people robbed in that road and some of them have even been killed. <clears throat> Anyhow, he accomplished his, 
his uh, mission that he was uh, traveling for. And the next time he traveled that way, he was anxious to see in the daylight the things that he had traveled over at night. And so he, you know, he was going along the same route. And uh, he came to the place where he had purchased the lantern. And he, you know, climbed up the mountain and went down the other side to the little stone bridge that crossed the, the valley there. And then he turned to the right to go up to where that house was. And when he got there, there was no house. And he thought, well, that's strange. Did it burn down? You know, what's the situation here? And he looked around and there was no house and there was no evidence that there had ever been a house there. God had created the house and created the situation to take care of him when there really was nothing there. And so God, God gave us that promise. I'm going to back up to that promise. I will do a new thing. I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God can create something to help us. No evidence of a house ever being there. Okay, we have a verse here in Mark chapter 16, verse 18. Jesus is again talking with his disciples. And he said, they shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And we have the story of Paul where they had been shipwrecked. And it was a cold and windy and dark, rainy night. And the people on the island where they, where they were able to finally get to started a fire and we have the story of Paul where he was helping there and says, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. And so even though this snake Maybe it bit him. We don't know what actually happened, but it was a poisonous snake, and the people expected him to die from getting bit by the poisonous snake, and he didn't. You know, God had had given the promise. Jesus gave the promise to his disciples. You can pick up snakes, or they can bite you, and they won't hurt you. Well, that verse also says something about poison. And uh, I read a story of uh, another man that was in communist country and he got arrested and he was put in prison. And one day the he was taken out of his prison cell and taken to a room, an interrogation room where there was a, a policeman and a doctor and they were sitting at a table and there was a Bible on the table and uh, the policeman asked him whether he believed that that book was the word of God. And he answered that he did. Then they asked him to read Mark 16, verse 18. And he read that verse. They, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And then the policeman asked him, do you believe this part of the Bible too? And the, the man said, yeah, he did. So then the officer took a glass of liquid and put it on the table. And he said, in this glass, there's a strong poison. If that book is true, the way you insist, this poison won't hurt you. But just to show you that we're not messing around, they brought in a big dog and gave the dog some of that, what was in that glass. And in a few minutes, the dog was dead. And so then the policeman asked the Christian man, he says, do you still claim that this book you call the word of God is true? And the man answered, yes, it is true. It is the word of God. Then drink the whole glass, the man, the officer said. The Christian asked for permission to pray first. He knelt down by the table and he prayed for his family. He prayed that his faith would hold up. He prayed for the doctor and for the officer there. And he said, Lord, you see how they've challenged you. I'm ready to die, but I believe your word 
that nothing will happen to me. If your plan is different, I'm ready to meet you. My life is in your hands. May your will be done. And he picked up the glass and drank the whole thing. The doctor and the officer were pretty amazed that he would even do it because they thought that he would be afraid and, and not do it. And so now they watched to see what would happen. They thought he'd, you know, pretty soon he'd collapse and die, but he didn't. There was complete silence. The minutes seemed like hours. Finally, the doctor made the first move. He felt the prisoner's pulse. It was normal. He continued his examination, but could find no symptoms, no evidence of harm. He couldn't hide his astonishment. Finally, he sat down, paused for a moment, and then took out his Communist Party card and tore it in half. He reached out for the Bible, took it in his hand, and held it reverently. From today, I also believe in this book. It must be true. I'm ready to believe in this Christ who did this thing before my eyes. God does amazing things sometimes. <clears throat> Another verse, Psalm 50, verse 15. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. We can ask for God's help whenever we have trouble. And this story comes a little bit closer to home for me. My sister Barb and a friend of hers were traveling. I don't know, they had been to a meeting or something, and they were coming back from the meeting. And uh, her car... My, my sister's car started making some noise and she stopped and looked around, checked things, couldn't find anything wrong. And so they kept on going and they were praying, but the noise was getting louder. And so she stopped again and checked everything that she could think of, trying to find out what was making that noise, but couldn't really tell anything that was that was wrong. But they kept praying and they thought, well, we've got to keep going. We There's no help for us here. And they drove another probably 20 miles or so, and the noise kept getting louder and louder. And finally, they got to a, a station, and they had a mechanic come out and, and look at the car. And after he checked it over, he came back to my sister, and he says, Lady, I don't know how you got here with that car. Your front wheel was held on by only one bolt, and that one was loose. The rest of them were all broken off. Another story of God's protection. When I was farming, we had sheep and uh, got to be in the fall when it was time to sell the lambs. And we had 40 lambs to take to the livestock auction. Mm -hmm. So I had them loaded in a trailer and uh, the whole family was going to go along because our kids liked to go to the livestock auction barn and see the animals that were there and everything and we were homeschooling our kids at that time so the, the plan was that on the on the pickup we had a, a a topper on the back of the pickup and the plan was that uh, the I'd drive and the family would would ride in the back and the kids would do some of their school work while we were driving and uh, so we'd have a kind of a an outing for the day and uh, this was before the days of seatbelt laws, and so the family was just going to be in the back and and uh, doing their schoolwork. And just as we were about to leave, our son, the oldest one, he was about, I don't know, 12 or something like that, got a terrible stomach ache. And uh, so my wife decided to stay at home with him and our youngest daughter, who was only, you know, four or five years old or something. But our middle daughter, Bethany, still wanted to go to the sales barn with me. And so she and I got in the pickup and uh, left. And uh, we were about a little over three miles down the road, going about 40 miles an hour, when I all of a sudden saw a flash of red on the right side of the, of the pickup. And a, a small pickup traveling really fast hit us 
right, right, basically right on the front wheel, just ahead of my driver's door. And we went skidding off the road into the ditch, almost at a 45 degree angle. It was almost like we had equal momentum. He was driving a small pickup and I was driving a full size pickup with, <clears throat> with a, a trailer load of sheep in it. And yet we went off the road as though we had this equal, equal momentum. And our pickup rolled over on its side and the trailer with the sheep with the lambs in it rolled over on it on its top and we weren't wearing any seat belts and when when we hit my i slammed over against the the driver's door and bent that door outward but it stayed latched and my daughter bethany came flying across the seat and hit me and she must have also hit the the shift lever because she had a dimple in her cheek after that. But otherwise, we weren't hurt. And I was able to climb out of the pickup on the on the passenger side of the pickup. We were laying on the side, so I had to climb up through that window. And I got Bethany out of there. And uh, we went to the closest neighbors, which was a few hundred yards down the road, and uh, had her call 911. And then she also called my wife and told her what had happened. The other, the driver of the pickup was an elderly man who we knew it a, a little bit. We didn't know him very well, but we knew who he was. And uh, he was slumped in the in the passenger side of his pickup. And he died in the, in the accident. But there was some question about whether maybe he had some kind of a heart attack or something that that made him lose his mental ability or whatever, so that he maybe stepped down on the gas or something because he was driving really fast and he wasn't even supposed to be driving at all, according to what his family said, and especially not fast like that on, a, on that little side road. And so, you know, here was all of this trauma going on. Um, we went and checked on the, on the lambs in the trailer and uh, they were all calmly eating whatever grass they could reach through the bars of the trailer. The trailer was totally upside down. And, uh, you know, the lambs were, were reaching through and, and getting some grass. And one of our other neighbors came by with his trailer and we loaded 37 of the 40 lambs into his trailer to take them back to our place. But we found three of those lambs dead in the front of the, of the trailer. Apparently, they had been standing with their heads against the front of the trailer, and uh, on impact, they must have broke their necks because they were, they died right there. And uh, we felt that if the family had been riding in the back of the pickup like the plan was, the same thing might have happened to them. And it was interesting that as soon as I drove out of the yard with Bethany driving out of the yard. Sean's stomach ache disappeared. And so it's it's almost like God gave him the stomach ache just to save the family. God works in interesting ways. We have a couple of descriptions here from the book of Daniel and from Matthew. Daniel 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So Daniel was prophesying a time of trouble coming. And Jesus, in Matthew 24, verse 21, says, Then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time nor ever shall be. And we are facing those times. We believe that we're in the end of time, that time of trouble is coming, that the great tribulation is coming. And what are we going to do about it? What's it going to be like to live through that? Well, I just want to bring up the same promises that I started with at the beginning. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. 2 Chronicles 16, 9. Isaiah 59, 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, 
neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. <clears throat> Psalm 91, verse 11. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Psalm 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him and delivereth them. And from the Desire of Ages, page 330. Our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. You know, these stories that I've shared have... Uh, a lot of times involved some pretty serious situations. Sometimes it was a, a matter of life and death. And I just, I just wanted to share a variety of stories just to show how God works in all kinds of ways to help his people in whatever the situation might be. And, you know, some of you have probably had experiences in your own life where God stepped in and did some incredible thing to save you or help you or whatever. But I'd like to share one more story of a situation that was not a life and death situation, but God stepped in and helped. We knew a lady who had grown up in a really bad situation. She lived on the street in bad company and you know lived a bad life, but she accepted the Lord into her life. She became a Christian, and she was in our church and she had a very simple and sincere faith in God. And uh, she would pray about everything. One Sabbath morning when she was getting dressed, she couldn't find her slip. And she prayed that God would help her find her slip. And she found it. And she told the church people that Sabbath, you know, God help me with this situation. Another time she couldn't find her keys. And she prayed that God would help her find her keys. And she found them. And she gave credit to God that he helped her with, you know, these things that she prayed about. And, uh, you know, this kind of raises a question. You know, why is it that God will sometimes help for just simple things, for just convenience purposes, and yet... There are people starving around the world and there are people in prison and, you know, there's terrible things happening and it seems like God isn't helping out those situations and yet he helps out in, in simple things. You know, of all of the terrible things that are happening around the world, why doesn't God solve those things? We want, we want God to, to help out in these big things. Well, if he was only interested in big things, he wouldn't have time for all the little things that happen in our life. You know, so there's kind of this, this situation of, you know, what, what can we expect from God? You know, there's, there's even stories in the Bible where it seems like God helped out in a, in a simple and common situation, and he didn't do something in a really serious situation, like the, the situation where uh, Elisha and the students of the, of the school were out cutting trees, to build a building for their school, and one of the boys lost the head of his axe, and God helped him get the axe head back out of the water. God did a miracle for him. And yet, when John the Baptist was in prison, God didn't stop the soldiers from taking his head. And, you know, God kept the Israelites safe, for 40 years in the wilderness, their shoes didn't wear out, their clothes didn't wear out. He did that to just keep them comfortable and, you know, provide for their basic daily needs. And yet, there are, there are many situations where people were killed. Isaiah was was killed. They say, you know, it doesn't say it in the Bible, but, but uh, according to tradition, Isaiah was killed by being cut in half with a saw. And... James and Stephen and the other apostles, they were all martyrs. There's all kinds of terrible things that were not prevented, and yet there's simple things where God stepped in and did something. So how do we handle that? We do serve a God that cares about everything, even little things. He, he cares about big things and little things. And sometimes he will save us from inconvenience. Sometimes he saves us from life and death situations. But we can always trust that he'll do what is best.
And sometimes something might happen in my life and I, I might think, well, this certainly can't be the best because it hurts. I don't like it. You know, God, do something about this. Well, sometimes we need to keep in mind that God is doing what is best for everyone, including the whole universe. And so there are times when he does things or doesn't do things because it's best in the big picture. You know, there's times when we don't understand what's going on. We'll question, you know, why doesn't God do something? Or why did he do that? Or whatever. But we can trust that he will do what is best. And so, you know, my point is, trust him no matter what's happening. Let him be God. Let him be the one that, that orchestrates life according to his all-knowing, his omniscience and his power and all of that. Trust him no matter what's happening. Let's pray. Amen. Our Father, we're so glad that you know everything, that you know what's best, and that you do help us many times. But even in times when it seems like things are going wrong, we can still trust you. We don't understand a lot of things, but we need to keep on trusting no matter what. And so I just pray that we would hold on and that in the end, as it says in Romans 8, things will turn out good in the end. You can make a good thing come out of anything. Thank you for being trustworthy. Help us to really depend on you and trust you no matter what's happening. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. He did well, it again. Yep, that went right along with Melissa's. <laughs> it sure did. It's interesting how God coordinates things. Yeah. Wow. And talking about how he how things happen and people don't understand it. Like you said, they just have to remember he is all. He knows and sees all. And um, just because something doesn't go the way you think it should... One day we'll understand and we'll see it. Yeah. Because there are people that talk about it and there are some people that, well, they're ex related, you might say, but they, they just don't believe because, um, you know, kids die and babies die and how come this happens? And if he really loved you, it wouldn't. And I'm like, if we never saw sin, what would we need him for? Yeah, right. Thank, Thank you very much. We need to recognize how bad things are so we appreciate the good. That's right. That's right. We're to give thanks in all things. Yeah. All things, good and bad, happy and sad. We might Thank not be Lord happy. And that's not always easy. We might not be happy in it. It might be painful. But yeah. we can trust him. We need to learn to do that. This was a beautiful message. Thank you, Amber. Praise the Lord. Yes. All right. Well, anybody have anything else to say? It's um I'd I'd like to I'd like to suggest something to anybody that's interested in it. Maybe some of you are already aware of it. There is a an, a YouTube channel called Stories of Faith. It was produced by a, an organization in in uh, Oregon, I think. <clears throat> All kinds of stories that they've had on there of God's help and deliverance and angel stories. And it just there's a whole series of stories. And it's just so incredible to listen to those stories of how God has helped people in dealing with all kinds of situations. So I just recommend going there. It's called Better Life Broadcasting, and the stories are called uh, Stories of Faith. So Thank I'd you. recommend that to anybody. Yep, we just never know. And I know there's been things that happened to me, and if I think back on my life and remember certain things, I'm like, 
I was so irritated at the time, but I think back on it and like, even in my, you know, out of the church days, things that happened, I shouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. And things that happened, I got annoyed because they did. And I look back on it, I'm like, had it gone my way, I wouldn't be here. You know, just some odd little things. I, it just, there's just so many things that he has done that I, I know he's got to be there because if it was up to the devil, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. God put me the same while I'm still here after all these years, after all the time I did and what I, you know, he didn't have to love me and continue. He could have given up a long time ago. But a lot of times when things go wrong, it's to help us grow and draw closer to him. Well, I know when I grew up, my uh, my parents, we was involved in two auto accidents and both of them was on the way to church. Mm. Wow. Uh, well, things happen and um, I was irritated because I wanted to continue what I was doing at that moment. And found out that had I, I wouldn't be here. I mean, it's kind of hard to understand, but he has saved me more than once. And at the time, I was begging everybody around to help me do what I wanted to do, and it didn't happen. So I know he's there, and we just have yeah. to keep remembering it. Yeah. Even yeah. sometimes in our in our foolishness. He steps in and helps us out of our foolishness. Yeah. yeah. We're like toddlers and he's our parent. We have no idea why daddy says no and we throw a fit. But he still keeps saying no. And we figure it out later that it was for our best. Yeah. We still don't know why it was for our best, but we know it was for our best. That's why we're told the children of God and not the teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thought kim <laughs> only the rebellious are teenagers the rest of us are still little kids <laughs> okay well as everybody knows we're having um passover we will have this coming <laughs> wednesday we'll have um prayer meeting we're doing selected messages and it is good I just am amazed at what she wrote. And then uh, the 20th, we'll have church here. And then the next Wednesday, we will not have anything because we'll be up at the camp and be having stuff that day. So, so everybody knows it's going to be nice. But Is it going to be broadcasted? Yes. So everything is good and... Um, God is with us. Amen. And Kim, a good one too, where you are. Yeah, we're we're going to probably have a, a small group here, but uh, we felt that it was important to be here. Well, that's good. All right. Well, I thank everybody for being here, and um, we will see you guys Wednesday if you come back. If not, next Sabbath.